All right, this is your final set of video notes for our Domain Eukarya unit, and these notes are going to focus on Kingdom Animalia. So here we go. First of all, a quick review, animal cell organelles and functions. Here's just a general slide with structure and function of an animal cell. If I were you, I'd pause this, just kind of look it over. Make sure you're roughly familiar with what everything looks like, where everything is. And we'll move on. So cell respiration, here's your quick review. Remember we start with glycolysis. If there is oxygen present, we're going to go into the mitochondria, go through Krebs cycle, and then eventually the electron transport chain. And remember that the electron transport chain produces the most ATP. We only go here if there's no oxygen present. And that really doesn't produce that much ATP. So what is an animal? An animal is multicellular, eukaryotic, and a heterotroph. And remember, their cells do not have cell walls. They're cell membranes, which gives them the flexibility and the ability to move, unlike that of plants. So essential functions. So we can feed. We have feeding systems. Respiration. We breathe oxygen in, breathe carbon dioxide out. We have a circulatory system and diffusion across membranes. So remember, diffusion is the movement of particles, and that's going to be your cell membrane. Excretion is waste, so it's a byproduct because of the metabolism of animals. Obviously, they have to have a way to get rid of it. We respond to stimulus. That's why we have a nervous system. We can feel things. We can touch things. And movement, which is skeleton and muscles. And then reproduction. Most, most animals are sexual reproduction, although a few can be asexual. So how are they classified? Two ways. We have invertebrates and vertebrates. So invertebrates, they obviously have no backbone or vertebral column, and these are actually 95% of all animals in the world, believe it or not. So these are things like insects, worms, jellyfish, sea stars. Vertebrates, on the other hand, are animals that have a backbone. And as I'm sure you could guess, this is 5% of animals. Fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. Although typically when someone says an animal, the first thing that comes to your mind is usually one of the vertebrates here not the invertebrates, but remember they are both animals. So two types of body support. So invertebrates have something called an exoskeleton, while vertebrates have an endo. Remember exo means out, endo means in. So the outside skeleton is a hard, tough outer covering, provides a framework of support. This is why, as gross as it may sound, bugs crunch when you step on them. Vertebrates, on the other hand, have their skeleton on the inside, so it supports the body. Muscles are against these bones, which give the structure of the body. So there's two types of body movement as well. So something can be mobile, fins, feet, legs, wings, like our whale down here. Or it can be sessile, which means it cannot move, like the sea anemone or sponges or coral. And notice how it says stay stationary during adult life. To be an animal, they have to be able to move at some point in their life, so they just don't move as adults. Body plans, we have types of symmetry. So you have your asymmetry, which is like our sponge here, which means no matter which way you cut it, it's not going to be equal on both sides. You have radial symmetry, which is like our jellyfish, and then you have bilateral. In terms of this, you always want to think about how you can divide it. So if you were to cut this animal in half, could you have equal sides or could you cut it in more than one way and have equal sides? So, and then just a second note on body symmetry. So bilateral symmetry animals are usually more mobile. They have anterior and posterior ends and they show something called cephalization, which is a concentration of nerve endings in the head area. So here's another little bit on cephalization. So CNS stands for central nervous system. So if you look Things like a hydra, which is a nidarian or like jellyfish related, or a sea star, they don't have a central nervous system. But if you look at our flatworm, our leech, or our insect, they all have a brain or somewhere where all of the nerves are centralized. So let's practice some symmetry. So a sea anemone, this is going to be radial. And this is because you could cut it here. You cut it this way, this way, this way. No matter which way you cut this anemone, it's going to be relatively equal on all sides. This guy, bilateral. And right there, you would cut him 
down the middle. Type of symmetry. This is no symmetry or asymmetry. Whoops. Because no matter which way you cut the sponge, even though it looks relatively close, it's not going to be symmetrical. So asymmetry. This guy, bilateral, cut right down the middle. And this guy. This could be, you could see this is a trick, but at first you might think, oh, okay. Whoops. Bilateral. But you could also cut it this way. You could cut it this way. You could cut it this way. Or you could cut it that way. So this is radial. So body arrangements and surfaces. This is another thing that can be pretty easy to confuse. So you have four terms. We have dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior. There's easy ways to remember this. Dorsal, first of all, when you hear the word dorsal, most people think of a dorsal fin. So a dorsal fin on the whale is on the back. So dorsal is the back or the upper surface. Ventral is like the belly. Anterior is the head or front, and posterior is the tail or hind end. And to keep that set, to keep that straight, post, if you're doing something post whatever, it's after. So think about it. Your hind end is after. Your head is the first thing you would see, and then the hind end of any animal or something swimming would what you would see last. So posterior is last, anterior is first. So here's just showing it in visual form. So you have dorsal and ventral, so they're opposites. And then you have anterior posterior, which are also opposites. So homeostasis, our favorite word. Quick review, what does it mean? Constant internal environment. So blood pressure, heart rate, anything like that. So we have two types. We have endothermy and ectothermy. Once again, endo means in. Ecto means out. So an endothermic organism can maintain its own body temperature, which is why things like polar bears can live in the Arctic. I'm sure it goes from this. Ectotherms, on the other hand, need the environment to help them control their body temperature, like our friendly little gecko down here. So animal reproduction. The male sex cell is a sperm. Female is an egg. We know that. Remember, a fertilized female egg is a zygote. Hermaphrodite produces egg and sperm in the same body. And there's two types of fertilization. We have internal and external. Remember, internal is combining inside the body. This is something like a human. Humans do internal fertilization. External is when they combine outside the body, and they must have an aquatic environment. So if you look at these fish over here, the female lays all her eggs. The male waits and he drops all his sperm on the eggs. And that's how they fertilize. They fertilize outside of the body. So this is really, really common in fish. So into the development now. So now we have a zygote. So it has to go undergo mitosis to divide. So as this happens, something called a blastula is formed. Easy enough definition right here for you. As it continues to form, a gastrula forms. So a gastrula has, is a two-layer sac with an opening at one end. This is how organisms develop. The easy way to keep this straight, B comes before G. So B is first. Gastrula is second. So three types of body tissues. So we have an ectoderm, which ecto remembers out. Endoderm, which is in. And mesoderm is middle. Okay? So this is the outer layer. Forms eventually the nervous system. The middle layer forms muscle, circulatory, excretory, and then the endo forms your digestive. So when you think about this, if you think about even your human body, your skin is on your outside. That's your ectoderm. Your mesoderm is things like your muscles. Those are over top of other things. So what they're over top of, for example, your stomach muscles, so or your stomach organs, sorry. So you have your stomach organs, which is endo, then you have muscles over that, which is your meso, and then you have skin over that, which is your ecto. So there's also three types of body plans. You have acelomate, pseudocelomate, and coelomate. So acelomates, easy enough, do not have a body cavity. Solid bodies, no circulatory system, like a flatworm. 
So if we look over here at this guy, he has this tissue filled region, which is the red. He has the digestive tract, which is the yellow. And then there's a body covering and that's it. Very, very simple systems. Something like a pseudo coelomate, if something pseudo, it's false or it's fake. So they're kind of like a coelomate, but not quite. So pseudo coelomates, they do have considered to have a body cavity, but it's not to the level of a coelomate. So it's fluid filled, which is the big thing, which limits this tissue and organ development. So these are still not very well developed organisms, kind of like a roundworm. And this picture over here shows you that. Shows you the epidermis, the cavity, the gut. Still not as detailed as us as a human or other coelomates. So coelomates have a body cavity. And the key to this body cavity is the adaptation of these organs or organ systems. So we obviously have very well adapted organs and organ systems. And in this, this body cavity is formed from the mesoderm. Meso, remember, means middle. And things like insects, fish, and you. And that right there shows the difference. So the really thing, the thing you really want to look at here is this difference. Here's another look at body cavities and just the differences. So once again, maybe pause this. I would read it over and really focus on those pictures and how they're different. So how does a unicellular colony form a multicellular organism? So this is just kind of showing you, once again, pause, look at this picture, examine it as you go through. You eventually, you start as a little ball of cells, you eventually become this development here, which is kind of like a gastrula, and it has a digestive cavity. So coelomate animals go even more in depth because they are based on what develops from this opening. So gastrulas, remember, are like this. So they have this opening. So protosomes the mouth develops from this opening. And deuterosomes, the anus develops from this opening. So which is which? Mollusks, arthropods, things that aren't as complex are going to have the mouth develop from this opening. Deuterosomes are things that are more complex, like anything with a vertebrate, like us and sea stars. Their anus develops first from this opening. So here's just kind of little things showing there. It shows the gut forming and as you know, if you think about it, your mouth leads to your gut and then your gut leads to your anus. So it depends on whether you work backwards to the mouth or forward from the mouth through. And then here's just another little thing of showing the cell stages and the development of the mouth versus the anus. Once again, maybe pause and look through this and make sure you understand it. And segmentation. So a couple other little things we need to talk, talk about. So segmentation in animals, they're put together in different parts. You can survive damage to one segment because the other segments help out. You also have better movement and flexibility because they can move independently. So are we segmented? The answer is yes. Do we need legs to move our arms? Do we need arms to move our body? Do we need our head to move our legs? No, you can move all these things independently of each other. Now obviously if you lose a limb, you will still suffer but we can survive damage to that limb, whereas other organisms can't. And then metamorphosis. Here's another cool little blip for you. So there's two types of metamorphosis. Most of you know metamorphosis as caterpillar turns into a butterfly, okay? But there's other insects that do this. So incomplete is three different stages. They go from egg to nymph to adult. And the nymphs resemble the small adults. So if we look here at this grasshopper, we start as an egg, the nymph is a little green guy, kind of looks like the grasshopper. And then we eventually get to the adult. Whereas complete is four different stages to eventually become an adult. And at no point do they look the same. So you start with your egg. Then you go to your caterpillar. Then your pupa or your cocoon. And then the butterfly. So incomplete basically is they don't completely change their structures. They pretty much look the same. And complete is four distinct different stages. Oops, and that is all for your notes.